All right, so I will talk about extremal problems for Birch hypergraphs. So I'm going to have to start by uh, reviewing a couple of things from Corey's talk, but basic things. So definition. So again, uh, define the generalized Tron number. So exn uh, tf. This is defined to be the maximum number of t copies possible. an f-free and vertex graph. Okay. So we remember this from last time, and just a few basic facts again from last time is that uh, for clicks, so it was proved by uh, Zyko and Erdos, and as, as Corey said, every graduate student ever, by Hungarian high school students, that the following was uh, for clicks, uh, this number is maximized by the Turan graph. So, uh, so in other words, this graph where we take uh, classes, t minus one classes, and we totally connect it. Yeah. Okay, so in the graph case, uh, going back to the graph case, there's another uh, very important result, the erdos storms monovich theorem. So, so they say in particular in the case where we're counting edges, uh, the Turan graph is maximizing the number of edges. So ex and let me write K2. F, well, it equals the number of edges in this thing, which is, uh, uh, so, chi F minus 1 choose 2, and over chi F minus 1, on this part. So this is for if F is at least uh, trichromatic. So not equal, but asymptotic. So, so basically, what it says is that if the if we have a graph which is at least through chromatic, and we want to maximize the number of edges, then the thing we do is we take the Turan graph. And that's asymptotically the best. So now, uh, did this not that was all good. So, going on to the generalized Turan setting. So the same the same thing holds. So it's a theorem of now, Alan and Schickelman. Did the same thing should hold for the generalized trot number. So, EX and for clicks, KRF. Well, again, we should take the Turan graph. So, that would give us uh, chi of F minus 1, chromatic number minus 1. Choose R. Uh, n chi of f minus 1, CR, uh, total clicks. And this holds when, when the chromatic number of f is, is at least, uh, sorry, at most uh, r. At least. Yeah. This is for r less than the chromatic number. So that's all the background I want to go over with the generalized Turan number. And now I'm going to switch to talk about better stuff for a while. So, uh, <coughs> so okay, definition. So a bearish path of length k and our uniform hypergraph is a sequence. Right, B1, E1, B2, E2, BK, EK, VK plus 1. 
So it's a sequence of, of alternating vertices and, and hyperedges uh, such that uh, for all i, vi and vi plus 1 are both uh, elements of, of vi. So in a sense, this is the this is the weakest, uh, the weakest generalization of a path you could imagine to, to hypergraphs. So for example, uh, so maybe we're in a three uniform hypergraph. So a bearish path might be we have like uh, hyper edge containing these guys. And then maybe the next, uh, the next vertex we use, there's a hyper edge which comes back and intersects in two. It's distinct. Everything is distinct here. VIs are distinct. EIs are distinct. Yeah. Distinct. Yeah. And then maybe the next hyper edge, it's, I don't know, it, it, only one. And the next hyper edge, it also contains something from the past, but, but that's okay. So, okay. so what do we have here? So in the graph case, Yeah, so in the graph case, there's this theorem of uh, Erdős and Galai. So they say if we have a, a path, or if we have a graph with no path of length k, so if G is an n vertex graph, with no pk. And the number of edges of G is at most uh, k minus 1 over 2 times m. So what is the construction for this? We just take n over k disjoint clicks. So uh, a path of length k has, has k plus 1 vertices. So we just take uh, k vertex clicks disjointly. Okay, so what's the what's the bearish version of this thing? So is is everything clear? So the, the number works out because what is this? So this is n over k clicks, each one we get k choose two edges. So in total we get k minus one over two times n edges. Yeah. Now, by the way, if anybody has any questions at any point, just interrupt me. It's totally fine. Okay, so the bearish hypergraph version of this thing. So theorem. So mostly done by um, Yuri Katana, so Junior Katana, and Lemons. You know the story about these uh, middle initials, right? That, uh, so you have the, the Junior Katana and the older Katana, and they uh, in Hungary, it's not really that common to have, have middle names, so they both have sort of made up uh, middle names. So you can ask uh, the older Katana, what is Dula O.H. Katana? And it doesn't actually mean anything, but he will joke and he'll tell you it means optimalish homas renser, optimal set system uh, Katana. <laughs> and if you ask the younger Katana, why is it Y in the middle? He'll just say, why not? And that is his, his joke. So it's, it's a cheesy, cheesy jokes. But. Laszlo Lovas, Laszlo M. Lovas, uh, I think it's actually Laszlo Miklos Lovas, so I think he might have a real middle name, but I don't know. But there's also this uh, Peter Erdős, Peter L. Erdős, the L doesn't stand for anything, it's just so that P. Erdős doesn't uh, mix up with Paul Erdős. <laughs> okay. So what did they prove? So they proved that, so this is the extremal number, I read the R, this means R from hypergraph. And vertices, and we forbid a path of length k. Uh, this is a path of k edges, in the bearish version. Then this is either n over k, k choose r, if k is at least r plus 1, otherwise it's n over r plus 1 times k minus 1, k at most r. Okay, I remarked so that the k equals r plus one. So they, they left one. They left one case. The k equals r plus one. So the k equals r plus one case. Uh, 
this one we worked out with uh, uh, Abudi, Yali, Abishak, so. so this was just for this one case, but they proved everything else. So this is the bond, and, and what is the construction? The construction is when, when k is at least r is basically the same construction. So we just take we just take clicks. So k k r k k r disjointly. And why is this good? It's good simply because we we don't. Uh, we don't have enough vertices to make a bearish path of length k, right? We can start taking hyper edges here. We have a lot of hyper edges, but it doesn't matter because we have to have these uh, distinct vertices, and there's not enough. Of them. Yeah. So this is in the big. This is for k at least r plus one, and then k is at most r. Uh, yeah. So here the idea is now. Instead of making the vertices the limiting factor, now we make the edges the limiting factor. So we take uh, groups of r plus one vertices, which is just big enough that we can start taking a lot of hyper edges on them, and then we take we take as many hyper edges as, as we can without generating a, a path of length k, which is k minus one. Now we do this disjointly. So these are the two sort of regimes here. Either we take clicks or we take just r plus one vertices and as many hyper edges as we can. And the point here is we don't take enough hyper edges that we run out. So, um, so the main the main thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, nonlinear case when we start getting uh, more than order n hyper edges. But I will also mention just one more thing, just because Kostochka is visiting. Next week we should mention some of this stuff. So, so this is for cycles of length at least k. Sorry, for this is for paths of length length k. How do we talk about bearish things for cycles? So for this, let me just uh, immediately introduce uh, Corey and uh, Donnie's uh, definition of what is a bearish cap of an arbitrary graph. So definition. So it, it sounds a little bit. Strange when I first say it, but then a picture will make it clear. So uh, let's say so a hypergraph. Hypergraph H is a bearish copy uh, let me say the hypergraph H it has vertex set um, V and edge set script E. So hypergraph H is a bearish copy of a graph F, let's say equal to U and E, if, well, there's some mapping from the vertices, so there exists a injection, phi mapping uh, U to V, and psi mapping E to this to uh, script E. So I guess the psi should be a bijection. Such that such that if we take some edge in our graph, it's covered by, by some hyper edge uniquely. So uh, such that if xy is an uh, edge in the graph, then Phi of x, phi of y, is contained in the image of the set. Okay, as I said, this is abstract nonsense, but what does it mean? So suppose that, uh, for example, suppose that the graph is this, uh, something like this. It just means that. Uh, we take these vertices, we have some hypergraph which contains all of these uh, vertices, and it has hyper edges which, which cover the respective edges. So there's some hyper edge which covers this hyper edge, so maybe something like this. There's some hyper edge which covers this edge, 
Maybe it contains all three of these vertices. It's fine. There's some hyperedge which covers these two. Maybe it looks like that. And then there's some hyperedge which covers the last, uh, the last edge. Maybe it's like this. Okay, so it's again the most sort of general class of uh, hypergraphs which you can define starting with a arbitrary graph. Yeah. Okay. Instead of? Well, because we, it can't be a bijection because we have too many, I mean, we have leftover vertices, right? We want, uh, I mean, if we, if we have a triangle, we want this to be an example of a triangle, for instance, in the hypergraph, right? Uh, this, this should be a, this should be a triangle in the hypergraph, but we have more vertices than we started with, so. But for the edges, I kind of want a one-to-one -one correspondence. I think you can you, you can make it uh, you can make the edge mapping an injection too, and then you can but then you just have to consider a bigger class. So, so it's more like growing every edge to a bigger set. Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Size of, from the edges of the graph to the edges of the hypergraph. So it's uh, yeah. So basically, it just says what Sangil said that uh, that you can sort of extend all of the edges in the graph into uh, into hyperedges. Yeah. Yeah, in a, in a sort of unique fashion that the, the hyper edges and the hypergraph you start with uniquely correspond to the edges in, in the graph. So that's that. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. So this is the notion that we play with here. Okay, so let me just state, uh, state these results about cycles and then I'll move on. So. If we take, uh, just let this be the set of cycles of length at least k. So this is k cycle, k plus one cycle, and so on. Then there's another theorem of Erdős and Galai, actually the one that implies the one which we already said. That uh, if G has no none of these cycles, so if G is C this k free, uh, then the number of edges in G is at most, um, what is it, n minus 1 over k minus 2, k minus 1 minus 2. In other words, coming just from these clicks, uh, a tree of clicks sharing vertices, for instance. This is the touch Something like this. Okay, so uh, so way, I mean, how to think about this? Uh, uh, just imagine it's a star. A star is the easiest case. So we have a bunch of a bunch of clicks sharing one vertex, and that's where we get n minus one because the one vertex is fixed, and then this uh, we choose the rest of the, the things for the click. Okay, so I just mentioned what is the status of this thing for the bearish case. So E, X, R, and bearish C, K is more or less finished now. Uh, C at least K, sorry. If you forbid a particular K, this is a different situation which resembles the classical extremal case where you forbid a cycle of a certain length. You get something like N to the 1 plus 1 over K, except for a weirdness that the odd cycles behave just like the even cycles. So if we forget all the cycles of a certain length, uh, maybe I won't, I won't write down the numbers, but I'll just show the picture. The picture is the same as like with the path case, more or less, that either we are taking, um, we're taking a tree of these clicks, which are now uh, uh, R clicks. This is if K is big. We assemble a, a K minus one, I guess, of uh, R clicks or we assemble a sort of tree out of these R plus one sets. 
the same way. So k minus 1, I don't know how to write k minus 1 sets out of the r plus 1 uh, elements. Yeah. And this was, yeah, this is, okay. so, for the post logica law, this is for k is at least r plus 3. Uh, I should hurry up. Then for r plus 2, r plus 1, with Yuri, we had to uh, rework this one out. For R, this is a recently uh, uh, recently done by uh, Yuri. Okay, I'll write the names. Yuri, uh, Lemons, Salia, Samora. Uh, R plus two, R plus one. This uh, who was it? Let's see. Uh, Who was on this one? Becca. Becca. Uh -huh. okay. Let's start with you. Uh, Ergam Lidze, yeah? Ergam Lidze. Yuri. Salia. Toku. Tompkins. Some more. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, also, they also worked out the K most often. So, strictly less than that. Without Kostochka, no, without Fidel. Yeah, okay. So basically the cycles are done. What's still open is the trees, actually. So there's still good questions here regarding trees. So the, the questions regarding trees, so the result of uh, uh, Gerbner, NLP, Matuku, Palmer, so, uh, actually, okay, so what happens, what, what do we imagine can happen in the tree case, right? So for graphs, so for graphs, there's this uh, conjecture of Erdős and Shosh that uh, for any tree, so if T is a tree with K edges, then extremal number same as Erdős Gala, disjoint clicks. So this is a conjecture which uh, had a proof announced in the 1990s by uh, Aitai Komlos Shimonovich and Simredi, uh, which I don't really know the status of it. It seems to be sort of true because uh, these people in Prague are using it to prove a bunch of other things. I mean, <laughs> Piget, Piget and Lackey and, and these people. So, but it's, it's still unpublished, so who knows? But, okay, so if we assume that this is true, then we have this result of Gerbner, Matuku, and Palmer, that under the assumption of, of this being true, that if K is at least R plus 1, and T is a tree, which, uh, said it, which is, for which this conjecture is true, and all of the subtrees of T, also satisfy this conjecture, then we have the bearish version, the uh, bearish version of the tree, at most uh, k minus 1 over, over 2. What am I talking about? It's uh, n over k times uh, k choose So this disjoint, uh, disjoint arc Yeah. You mean bt? bt, yeah, thank you. This fixed T. Fixed T. So okay, I'll write the conditions. <coughs> so T is a tree satisfying the you know, Schorsch conjecture, uh, but not just T. Also, its subtrees should also satisfy the Erdős Schorsch conjecture, and then this part has been proved. It's maybe a little bit stronger than you actually need to, but, but you do need to assume some early shush stuff. And then I'll just mention what's, so we saw with the path case that there's these two sort of regimes, that either we have these R plus 1 sets with K minus 1 hyper edges, or we take the clicks. So we do have some progress in this uh, regime. Uh, 
So this is with a One time that I was I was trying to memorize for each letter which which number it goes with, so I could just quickly compare it. And I was driving while I was doing this, and uh, I ended up uh, losing the left the left mirror of my car because I was trying to do this. So the end result is I just never. Every time I have to write the letters, I have to think about which uh, <laughs> which order they come in. So, yeah. so what we proved is uh, if uh, in the regime where uh, R is big, so now R is bigger than K. So R is at least k times k minus 1, something like this, or maybe it's k minus 1 times k minus 2, I forget exactly. So if R is big, then uh, Ex, R, and Bt, T is a k edge tree, is at most uh, the same construction, so n over R minus 1 times k minus 1. Uh, so maybe I just briefly mentioned, so why do we have to assume R is at least k squared? So sort of the idea is, the idea on this proof is we want to find, we want to find a substructure of a hypergraph where uh, all of the hyper, so we con contract the hyper edges, and we want all of the hyper edges to still have size at least k minus 1, and all the, all the vertices to have degree at least uh, k minus 1. So basically what we do is we look at, uh, we look at this bipartite graph formed by the edges of the hypergraph and the vertices of the hypergraph. And we want to find a subgraph of this where the movement degree is something like k minus 1 to try to embed the tree. But if you compute, if, if you compute this, so we need a, sort of a high average degree to find a minimum degree subgraph like this. So if you compute it, it's something like the number of edges. So the number of edges in this hypergraph is, well, it's the number of edges in the hypergraph times r, is the number of edges in the graph, divided by the number of vertices, which is the number of vertices in the hypergraph plus the number of edges. And if you want this to be something like this, then this r is the assumption you need for this to hold. Maybe we wouldn't need a 2 here, but you get the idea. So, it's so what were the bounds on the conditions on r? On the r is at least lower. So here, so if we assume Erdos Shosh holds, ah, so this yeah. is without, that assumption. without the assumption, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is without that, but the regime is very different because uh, in this k bigger than r case, it sort of behaves like the classical Erdos Shosh thing that you take disjoint clicks, but here you do this weird thing: you take disjoint sets of r plus one vertices with k minus one hyper edges. So it's, it's a little bit different. <laughs> This is, this, is, this computation is the average degree of this graph, basically. But, uh, so we define this graph, the incidence uh, bipartite graph associated with the hypergraph. And we compute how many edges are here. Well, it's the number of hyper edges in the original graph times the uniformity. And how many vertices are here, it's just this. And it's a bit of a computation, but if you want to see what assumptions you need for this to be big enough that you can get a good minimum degree subgraph, you need, you need something like this. Actually, the proof is a lot more involved than that, but it's sort of technical and maybe not so interesting for short talk. Okay. But what, what remains open, for instance, is, well, okay, of course, removing the uh, Erdos Shosh uh, assumption here would be nice, but if you could do that, you'd prove Erdos Shosh, so maybe it's hopeless. But uh, in, in this regime where, where uh, R is bigger than K, but uh, smaller than K squared, should be true, but we can't prove it here. And in fact, uh, proving this bearish extremal number even for very simple trees. So for stars, ah, one assumption here, which I didn't say in our theorem, is we have to assume that T is not a star. That's the only tree it doesn't work for. Okay. Uh, but uh, what we cannot compute is the uh, extremal number of a bearish version of a double star like this. And it seems innocuous enough, but it's actually, it's... <laughs> Somehow tricky. So these would be interesting questions here. And actually, right now with uh, with Cor Corey and Kevin and, and Abby, we're we're trying to do stuff in the uh, assumption when we have the assumption that the ground hypergraph is linear. 
So this is somehow an interesting, interesting regime where now instead of instead of clicks, we're taking Steiner systems, and uh, so there's a lot of interesting questions. Okay, all right. Now I want to switch gears a bit to go to the uh, go to the uh, super linear case. That's more or less what's known in the linear case. So let me start with an important lemma from the original paper of Corey and Donny. So what they proved is that we always have the following. Ex, uh, N, Kr, so for any F, So these, these simple bounds hold for the uh, bearish version of any, any fixed f, which we say. So what is this saying? So it's saying that the extremal number in our uniform hypergraph of a bearish copy of f is lower bounded by the maximizing the number of kr clicks in a f-free graph. Okay. So what is the proof of this first, uh, the first inequality? It's, uh, well, it's sort of an easy thing that we imagine we have a graph. Take a graph with the most number of KRs with no F. Now to each KR associate a hyper edge. Okay. Now I claim that this hyper edge will have no bearish copy of F. And the reason for that is simply that if we if we take a hypergraph and we look at its two shadow, we look at the edges which are the two edges which are contained in the hyper edges, then if we don't find a copy of F there, we cannot find a bearish copy of F. So maybe I will remark this, it's an important fact. So uh, so, if the two shadow of a hypergraph, in other words, the set of x, y such that x, y is in some hyperedge, so if the two shadow has no f, then h has no bearish f. So this is this is pretty clear. The converse is absolutely not true. Yeah. And actually most of the uh, most of the proofs on these kind of things are sort of proving a partial version of the converse of this. But in general, of course, we can have we can have copies of of F in the two shadow without being uh, bearish copies of F. Yeah. Okay, so the lower bound is clear then. We just replace the clicks with the uh, hyper edges. So let me just sketch how the upper bound goes. So. so the way the, the proof of the upper bound goes is, is you just put, um, suppose I have an RU from hypergraph without a bearish copy of F in it. Begin inserting a edge in every hyper edge. Uh, unless I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Because I've already filled up all of the edges in the hyper edge, and therefore I have a click. And if I have a click, then let's say I color the click uh, red, and then I move on. So put an edge in each hyper edge. And if I can't, then I'll just color the click red, let's say. Okay. Now when I'm doing this, in this graph which I generate, I don't have a copy of f. Because if I, had a, if I had a copy of f, because I put a different edge in each hyper edge, each actual edge I've added to the graph, not a color of an edge, but each actual edge I've added to the graph, I put a new one for each hyper edge. So if this graph was to have a copy of f, I would have a bearish copy of f in the hyper graph, because each edge corresponds to a different hyper edge. So this, this graph which I generate is f-free. And uh, how many steps? Have I done here? So the number of hyper edges in my hypergraph, well, it equals the number of edges in this graph plus the number of uh, 
red clicks I, I generate. Okay. And yeah, so the number of edges in the graph is, is bounded by the uh, classical extremal number, and then the number of red clicks is just bounded by the number of, of clicks in, a, in an F free graph. So actually, both of these bounds turn out to be sort of easy once you see the trick. Now, given these bounds, I'd like to uh, make an important, important remark that uh, what is true is suppose that f is so big that its vertex number is at least the uniformity r. So suppose uh, the vertex number of f is at least the uniformity of the hypergraph r. If this is the case, then this, this case never happens where I generate a click, because if I generate a click, I'd already have a copy of a bearish copy of f. So in this case, we have the simpler upper bound that exr and ef is bounded by the classical extremal number. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So if R is at least at least the number of vertices in the in the graph which we're forbidding, uh, then uh, it's the case that the extremal number for a bearish copy of F is bounded by the classical extremal number. And in particular, you know, there's at most n squared edges in a graph. So let me write big O n squared here. Now. Let's, uh, okay, so this is remark one. Now, let's make a second observation based on this inequality. Uh, recall this, this theorem I mentioned of Alain Shikovin that generalizes the ernest stolz theorem that says that, that if, if the chromatic number is bigger than the uniformity, then uh, uh, what happens? Then these extremal numbers of KRs in an F-free graph uh, behaves like the Turan graph. So it grows like n to the power of r. So, so if um, the chromatic number of the graph which we forbid is bigger than the click size we're counting, then well, e x n k r f it, it, it grows like the uh, Turan number grows like the number of copies in a Turan graph. So what's our picture here? So we, we already have a sort of nice picture of what is the, oh, first a corollary. So here's our lower bound on this uh, generalized Turan number. Now let's translate it back to here. So for r at least 2, we can forget about this classical extremal number. And it means that the bearish extremal number behaves just like this uh, counting number when r is at least 2, but uh, the chromatic number is still bigger than r. So we know the growth rate of ex, r, and bf in the range when the chromatic number is bigger than r. And in a sense, we know uh, what happens when r is bigger than the vertex number. So we begin to get a sort of picture in the situation. So here's the picture. So here's R, okay. And up until we reach the chromatic number of F, up until we reach the chromatic number of F, the extremal number is like n to the R. So it's as R increases, the extremal number is like n to the R. And this holds all the way up until the chromatic number is equal to the uniformity. And then in this case, the Alain Shikamin result, it tells us that we drop now below. So no longer is uh, the Turan graph the best, but now we're smaller. And now if we go out further to the size of the vertex set of F, it eventually happens by the Gabner-Palmer result that we are now quadratic, big O n squared, eventually. 
<coughs> so eventually we get down to n squared, something like this. So down to n squared or below by the time we get to the vertex number. Okay. So now it's a natural question, what happens? Do we just continue at n squared, or does it drop further, or, or what can we say? Yeah. So the result I'd like to talk about is that if r is big enough, if r is big, even bigger, then uh, eventually we get that ex, r, and ef is subquadratic. So big enough, it means, uh, let's go way out here to the Ramsey number of f versus f minus an edge. Mm -hmm. So if we go out this far, eventually we drop to a little one squared. And uh, in some sense, this is sharp, because there's, there's triangle-free graphs they have. Uh, you know, n to the 2 minus epsilon for any positive epsilon amount of edges. So basically, this, this is the long-term behavior. So what I'd like to do next is uh, explain this proof about how we, how we know that eventually we get to zero n squared, if the uniformity is huge. <coughs> okay, so to do that, let me first... Uh, Recall something, the removal lemma. The removal lemma says that if we only have literal n to the v of f copies of f in a graph, then there exists literal n squared edges representing all copies of f. So if Presenting, I mean that if we delete these little n squared edges, we've deleted all copies of f in the graph. So this is the graph removal lemma. Okay. So the first claim, which will allow us to use the graph removal lemma, is if uh, h is a BF-free hypergraph, And R, it's sufficient to say vertex number of f for this, for this case. If the R is at least a vertex number of f, then the two shadow, the set of edges in the uh, contained in hyper edges, has at most uh, little n to the R copies of f. So this is what's going to let us use the removal lemma. So let me switch to the other board. So what's the idea here? The idea is, is look at the two shadow. And what, what must happen is if we find a copy of f, if we find a copy of f, two of the edges in that copy of f have to belong to some hyper edge in the original hypergraph. Because if it was always the case that each edge had its own hyper edge, then we'd have a bearish copy of f. So there exists h. Uh, such that H contains two edges, case one, case two. Okay, so we find a copy of F, and it's always the case that we have uh, some hyperedge H, which has two edges from that F, 
because if that wasn't the case, we'd have a different hyper edge for each f, and we'd be able to uh, we'd be able to find a bearish copy of f. Okay, so the worst case is this uh, thing where we have two edges sharing a vertex. So let's just work in that case. So in any copy of f, we, we find such a hyper edge. So now let's enumerate the copy of f uh, copy of f in this way that we look at the different hyper edges in the hypergraph. And for each of them, uh, find the possible uh, two edges involved in the uh, bearish copy of f, and then extend f uh, arbitrarily for the rest. So we start with the number of hyper edges. So we fix the hyper edge, and now we look at which, uh, which vertices could be involved, which three vertices could be involved in a copy of f. So how many ways to do that? So we have R choose three, pick the three vertices involved in the copy of F. And now we take that copy of F and we extend it totally arbitrarily. So find the remaining uh, V of F minus three vertices. This N minus three, uh, choose V of F minus three. Okay, so thus far we found we found all the vertices which are involved in F, and now well on this vertex set maybe we have many different ways to embed F. Uh, trivial upper bound is we can say V of F factorial. It's a constant. Who cares? This is a upper bound. So so the number of F copies is bounded by this. And if you look at this, well, E of H, notice that one assumption was that R is at least the vertex number of F. And therefore, by Gevner Palmer, this is at most big O n squared. So in total, we have n squared here. We have n to the v minus 3 here. So this is big O n to the v of F minus 1. In other words, little o. Therefore, removal lemma applies. Okay. So, so we find the set R. We find the set R of n little n squared edges representing all of the f. Uh, copies in the two shell. Okay, so now we're almost done. Uh, the next step is a uh, well, it's a kind of a clever, kind of a tricky uh, double counting thing. The claim is that in each hyper edge we take, so if we take a hyper edge in H, uh, there will always be an edge in that hyper edge, which is both in R, and it's at most e of f minus one uh, other hyper edges. So claim is that for all hyper edges, there exists an edge, let's say in the two shadow of the hyper edge, such that e is in R, the removed set, and uh, and at most e of f minus one hyper edges contain mm -hmm. okay. So the meaning of this will become clear in a moment. So now we want to we want to use this Ramsey bound to find such a thing. So what have we assumed? We've assumed that R is at least a Ramsey number of f versus f minus an arbitrary edge from f. Okay, so let's let's take a hyper edge h, 
And let's suppose by contradiction that all of the edges in the in R and in the two shadow of this hyperedge are in at least uh, E of F uh, hyperedges. So by way of contradiction, all edges in R intersect this two shadow in at least E of F hyperedges. So let's take a, a two coloring. So color, say, two shadow, intersect R, color this blue, let's say, and the two shadow minus R, color this red. Okay. Now, this set has no F, because that's what the removal lemma says. We, you know, R represents all the copies of F. So this set has no F. Okay. Because that's what removal lemma says. And therefore, this set must have F minus E. Ramsey. Okay. So let's look at this set. So here's the hyperedge H. We find F minus E. Here is f minus e. Okay. And here is e, which is missing, which we wish to, wish to embed to an arbitrary remaining vertex here. Okay. Or it could this e could be between two things too. That's totally fine. Yep. So <clears throat> we find this. Now, how do we complete the embedding? So, so let h itself embed e. So h embeds e. And then since we assumed that uh, everything is in at least uh, EF hyperedges, after dealing with H, everything is still in at least EF minus 1 hyperedges. So we may now embed the rest of these hyperedges to find a, a bearish copy of F. So use assumption. This assumption. So that does that. So the claim is, is complete. So now we really have this that uh, for every hyperedge we take, there's some edge in it which is in the remove set and is also not in too many hyperedges. Now the proof concludes by a simple counting. So let's go, go through the hyperedge, uh, the hypergraph one by one, and look at the hyperedges. And in each hyperedge we, we take a, a set for a uh, take a Two edge from R. Okay. Now, what can happen? Maybe as we go through, we take the same two edge from R multiple times, but we don't take it more than uh, EF minus one times, because that's the assumption here. So, in other words, the number of hyperedges is bounded by the size of the remove set times E of F minus one. Just by greedily picking an edge each time and overcounting it almost as much. And now, by the conclusion of the removal lemma, this is at most little n squared, so in the end, we get little n squared. Okay. And that finishes that proof. How, how much time do we actually have, Sonia? Is it five more minutes, or ten more minutes, or no more minutes? <laughs> okay, then I just do yeah, something yeah. fast with the rest. Okay, so now let me just briefly discuss the, the lower bounds. Uh, okay. So this, this theorem means that we can naturally define a sort of threshold which tells us which R uh, eventually drops us down to little o and square. So let us define threshold of F this is equal to the minimum R0 such that if R is at least R0, then EX uh, R and EF is little one squared. If such a thing exists by what we just proved. And similarly, let's define a threshold 
THLF. It's the same exact thing, except now I assume I assume that the ground hypergraph is also linear. What does a linear hypergraph mean? It means that each pair of hyperedges in the hypergraph intersect in only one vertex or no vertex. Okay. So what we proved is that uh, this is at most Ramsey f f minus e. Uh, but what I would like to show is we also have a lower bound of a uh, tick number of f minus one squared plus one. But in proving this, uh, we can just as quickly prove the following: that the linear uh, on the linear case. Actually, for the real threshold number, the answer turns out to be exactly the chromatic number of f, which is perhaps surprising. But I don't think there'll be a time to prove the upper bound of this. But the lower bound is relatively straightforward. So let's take a let's take a uh, a graph f, and let me construct a chi f minus one uniform linear hypergraph. With no f. Okay, so chi minus one uniform linear hypergraph with no Irish copy of f. All we have to do is we take a grid. Uh, going this way, we have chi f minus one. Going this way, we have n over chi f. Minus one. Now I take lines on this grid. And the way a line works is I pick a bottom vertex, but I only pick one of those bottom vertices in the first half of this stuff. So I take some bottom vertex on the first uh, n over two chi minus one. So I only go up to a half, I pick some bottom vertex. Okay? And now I pick a slope. So uh, how many over I go with each step up I go. Okay, so I pick a slope, but I want it to be that when I pick the slope I don't run off the off the end. So I pick one of n over well two chi minus one squared uh, slopes. Because if I do this, then if I go uh, chi minus one steps, I still won't be across the edge because I started in the first half. Yeah. So in the end, I have this many ways to pick my starting point, this many ways to pick my slope. And then I just take these lines with the different slopes, like this. okay? And uh, maybe I won't prove it, but this is quite clearly a linear hypergraph because two of these lines are only intersecting in a, in a unique point. And the number of these hyperedges is just n squared over four chi minus one cubed. But it, importantly, omega n squared. Okay. So this proves. This proves the lower bound of this, that if I have only a chi minus one uniformity, then I can construct an n squared size linear hypergraph with no bearish copy of f. And in basically the same exact fashion, we generate this, uh, this lower bound, because what we say now is start with the same hypergraph, but now, okay, for speed I'll just erase. Let me put the click here, click number. So basically I'll find a lower bound, find a hypergraph without bearish f, by finding a hypergraph without a bearish copy of the largest click in F. That's the idea. So do the same construction, but now blow up every vertex by uh, uh, omega minus one. So it's the same exact linear construction, but everything is blown up by omega minus one. And it's pretty clear that we don't have a click here because uh, first off, I mean, I, there's only omega minus one things in each class and there's only Omega minus one classes in each line, so any click will have to use two vertices from one class and one vertex of another class. Let's say, but if we take two vertices from one class and one from another class, well, those already uniquely define a hyperedge in this hypergraph. So we don't have enough new hyperedges to embed a full a full click here. So, so this is a construction here. So, uh, yeah. And actually, so there are some improvements to the lower bound that you can kind of, you can find combinations of this uh, chromatic number of lower bound and this uh, omega f minus one squared lower bound uh, using different partitioning arguments. And for some graphs, these combination approaches are, are better. But in general, we still don't really know the lower bound. 
And uh, maybe I just conclude with one sort of open question is that everything I've talked about is in the quadratic regime, that we start with a uh, some, say, three chromatic graph, and then we eventually show that it drops down to uh, little o n squared eventually. But it's a pretty natural question. Is it true in general? So let f be, say, bipartite, uh, not a forest. Is it true that ex are n b f equals little o ex n f? eventually, for large enough r. True or false? We don't have a single f where this is true, and we don't have a, a, a proof where this is false. So we don't know, we don't know a damn thing about this one. So uh, for instance, the most basic case is f equals c4. In the c4 case, there turns out to be a three uniform growth five hypergraph, which you can blow up by a factor of three to get a nine uniform hypergraph with no bearish copy of a C4. So for C4, we know that R would have to be at least 10 to, to disprove it. But for instance, we do not know we do not know whether there exists a 10 uniform hypergraph with no bearish C4 and uh, order n to the three half edges or not. So, so lots of work to do. So thank you.